Hey everybody, it's your buddy Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show with another one of our Afghanistan log entries. Today we have another full colonel, Xander Bullock, who is, uh, well, look, he's got more than one master's degree and one of them is from SAMS. And if you get a degree from SAMS in the military world, that means you're one of the brightest people they've got. And then... The U.S. government said, hey, we want to take a couple of you guys and work on a special project and figure out the right strategy for Afghanistan going forward. And Xander was one of the guys they interviewed and said, we want you. Xander and I have a long conversation about what the hell just happened in Afghanistan. And one of the things we get into is the equipment left behind. What does that mean? And let, let's take a sane, reasoned approach to this thing. Let's not go crazy. Let's not just start blaming people. Let's understand what was going on there. That strategy piece comes in, too. What was the strategy? Why did they design it this way? What was the goal? What was the intention? Did it work? Did it not work? You know, we, we don't know. But understand the work that went into that strategy. And then the pullout. And, I, and you have to understand, Xander's actually still active in the military. So when he's talking, he has to be respectful of his of his uh, oath. He has to be respectful of his position and uh, of the folks who are in command and in charge above him. And so you're going to hear him not dance around the topics, but speak very carefully, but being candid. So when you listen, listen with that in mind, in that, in that Xander is trying to be respectful for a lot of different things, but also be honest and candid. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him on. I appreciate it. One of the things that you don't get to see uh, on the background is I talk to a lot of people like this. And it's just amazing to me the amount of stuff that I know. And, and let's just be straight up right here. I'm going to blow my horn for a second. Very few people know more about Afghanistan, in particular about the ground, about the reality, about what happens on the ground from an American perspective working in these complicated areas, which projects me to know about the ground truth in a lot of areas wherever Americans are doing it. And that has very little to what we're, doing, what we're talking about. And Xander is particularly smart in the strategic and log logistics side of things. So you're getting, you're getting someone who has a very, very intimate and professional level knowledge that you don't see talking somewhere else. You're not going to, you're not going to get that. And uh, we both have massive respect for one another. I mean, he'll, he'll be so nice and say such great things about my work. And, and uh, I feel similarly like, man, I, I wish we could have worked together because his level in terms of strategic and my level ground truth, we don't often get to work together when we're deployed. And that's a big problem. And we actually should probably do a show about that. Anyhow, I don't want to talk for too long. Listen, I'm serious about this. You guys, that PayPal link, breakitdownshow.com, it's such a big deal for me. It really, really, I, I can't encourage, like if you guys could see, if you could walk around with me and understand the amount of work we put in here, the passion and what just a little bit of extra money does. It's, it's not, look, I'm not making a lot of money doing this. I'm not walking around like, Mwah, I'm the richest guy in the world. That is not happening, right? We're building something. It's getting bigger. It's getting greater. And you guys can really support me by doing this. And I would really, really appreciate it. Go to the breakitdownshow.com, click on that PayPal link, and just put a little bit of money in. Do a subscription. Do 20 bucks. I bet you, I bet you, and I'm talking to you, I bet you there's a subscription that you have right now. Maybe it's the Six Flags and you don't go anymore. And that was for 20 bucks a month. Why don't you turn that one off? and turn one on for me. Change your mind later on, that's great. If you see me slipping, take the money away. But what app, what service is going to work harder for you than I am? I'm going to put an hour together constantly throughout the month. Look on the YouTube side. You see what we're doing. There's all kinds of little shorts coming out. Oh my God, we're working hard. That's what you're supporting. And I will tell you, the money goes into the gas tank. It goes into me getting on the road. It buys me a plane ticket. Um, I'm going to work hard. I promise. That's what you guys are going to get out of this. So go to the PayPal link, click on that. That really would mean a lot to me. Thank you all so much if you do it. And if you don't do it, please do it. It really means a lot. Okay. Enough about that. This episode was Xander Bullock. I'm telling you right now, strategy, logistics, and what the hell happened? Why did this go so bad? Here comes Xander Bullock. We get to meet a lot of cool people along the way. I got to meet a guy named John McKay a couple of years ago through Scott Husing. And Colonel John McKay is a master. If you don't know John's stuff, go to YouTube, look up John McKay, P. Day Turner, and you will see all of the episodes. The dude is fascinating. He uh, He's currently writing his memoir. Believe me, you want to read that when it comes out. He is so seasoned in international things. And, and he's sort of like my... Uh, my, my biggest big brother in terms of international relations, sitting across from someone, having tea, creating influence, and being able to understand the international dynamics. He's just about native-born uh, South American with Spanish. He speaks Quechua. He probably has spent more time in South America, Central America, than he has in America. 
Uh, he's a fantastic Marine. He's su it's such an honor to know him. And he and I go through a lot of this Afghanistan stuff. This is the the latest in this week's series of shows on the topic. And the reason why we're covering this is, especially with John and I, is like, what's next? What do we got to do to get this right? Um, what kind of military do we need to create? Because the military we want and the fight that we get offered are not the same things. So we have to figure out how we do this better because what just happened in Afghanistan is not how this is supposed to work. And I hope you guys can appreciate that. Part of what we're doing here is putting work in to be able to say, here's reference points. Here are, here are very, very, very bright people. John is exceptionally experienced, exceptionally wise and exceptionally bright. He's about to have something come out in the Washington post. I believe it's going to get published. We we're waiting to see, and that should be out. And he and I are going to talk again. And uh, I just can't get enough of his ideas, his concepts on partnering, on how we do foreign relations better. And I think you're going to appreciate how we struggle with this topic of how do we make the right fighting for us. And so here comes the guy, the Colonel, the man, former U S Marine, always a Marine, John McKay. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is, Greg this is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Ames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> hey, good morning. This is Colonel Xander Bullock, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, I'm excited about this, man. We're uh, we're about to talk about some serious uh, topics with the uh, what I've been calling the uh, the retreat from Afghanistan overall. I mean, that's what well, ultimately we're doing. Some of the questions I think that you're uniquely positioned to help us understand are um, like this uh, this idea that we just abandoned a bunch of equipment to the Taliban, and now they have jets and zillions of rounds and. Uh, Apache helicopters, all this stuff. Now, there is some truth to this, but you specifically are, are good at helping us understand what it means to leave something behind and how those decisions are made. I mean, is, like, is this just a bunch of dudes walking away from their post and saying, abandon ship and leaving a helicopter behind? No, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, I need to make two quick disclaimers, uh, one for self-preservation and one in humility. Uh, before Before we get started, you know, I'm an active duty army officer. So everything I'm about to say is not the position of the United States Army or the Department of Defense. We'll say that for self-preservation. And as a disclaimer, um, you know, I'm a colonel in the army and colonels run the army a lot and I am inherently part of the problem. So you gotta take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, so we'll, we'll start with those two quick disclaimers up front. Th thanks for the opportunity to be on the show and, and to talk to you, Pete. I'm a big fan of your work, and I appreciate just, just the chance to, to, uh, to discuss what I think are some absolutely critical topics. To roll into the question with, how, you know, how, what would I know? Um, I was the uh, – I, I spent three years, three and a half years at CENTCOM staff, and I was the logistics operations officer that ran the jock floor during the drawdown in Syria um, just recently. And so I've kind of seen, I've done this. I've seen inside the machine. I know how this works. I'm not working there now. So I, I'm not I'm not in the machine for this current one, but I, I know a lot about how this works. When you say jocks, you're talking about a joint operation command. And I guess CENTCOM, we kind of know, but just CENTCOM is uh, that part of the world that Afghanistan is in, among other places. Iraq is in CENTCOM and there's a bunch of other places. Did the, um, did the withdrawal from Syria, did that go normally would you say it was a good job would you say we could have done better was it president trump's fault anything like that it, the the uh the timelines we had were very tight for the uh logistics infrastructure in that part of the country this was accelerated by the trump administration over christmas i might add so was, um he made the announcement uh that we were going to pull out on like 11 december by the new year so it's one of the few times in my life where i uh, completely worked through uh, Christmas Day morning and New Year's when I wasn't deployed. But yeah, no, I, I think it went really well. It was very professional. Um, it was very similar in that you had a partner force, you were trying to leave equipment. You had a lot of equipment that had to get out very quickly, very high visibility uh, operation. You know, what, what that mean by that is like, 
you know, daily inquiries from Congress people and White House staffers and et cetera, like how many containers are on the ground right now? How many people are on the ground? How much sensitive equipment, all, you know, all that. Uh, we were we were proffering tw twice a day uh, formal reports to the White House on that one. And I'm sure the Afghan drawdown today looks very similar. So I, I've seen what that looks like. I've lived that. Um, it's really painful, frankly. <laughs> um, so to, to answer your question, uh, the, the first question, you know, see Sticka, so the, the, there are different commands involved. There's a training and advising command in Afghanistan. There's a combat command in Afghanistan. Um, and then, which for most of the last four years was commanded by General Scotty Miller. And then there's CENTCOM, which is germane to this conversation because while um, General Miller, for most of my tenure, had command in Afghanistan. CENTCOM runs all the logistics for Afghanistan. Um, so that's kind of how they divide the command responsibilities. We were, um, in the last five years, in a mode of full-on support logistically to the Afghan National Security Defense Forces. I'm going to call, I'm going to say ANSDF probably a lot in this conversation because it's Afghan Army and Afghan Air Force. Um, so you could say Afghan Army, it's shorthand, but you know, we, we were in a mode where we were deliberately trying to transfer six, 700,000 rifles, um, as many armored vehicles as we could, um, as much. We we're, we're trying to get them fielded with Super Tucanos for direct air support. It was determined that they would do better with props than jets for close air support in that terrain. So we were giving them uh, prop, prop uh, Super Tucanos and Blackhawks and everything else we could do for them. I mean, we were, we were full on trying to give them equipment. Um, and, and you know, that, that's how, that's how it went. So we did give them tons of equipment. And just like when the Iraqi army lost to ISIS, uh, a couple of years back, when, when to the victor goes the spoils, when an army turns and, uh, crumbles or flees the battlefield, um, you know, there, there is an enormous amount of equipment that gets left on the battlefield. And in this case, particularly the, the nearly bloodless seizure of Kabul, where the method of taking Kabul was turning the loyalty of the, of the warlords in the region, all that American equipment came with them. And, you know, and it was just, th that wasn't an oversight, I wouldn't say by any one in particular. Um, that was just, hey, we gave all the stuff to the Afghan National Defense Force um, and, and they turncoated and they took it with them. Um, it had already been signed over. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was lost. Everyone knew it was. At this point. This is Afghan. what's that? This is the Afghan security forces equipment. Then, like, this is not ours anymore. We had, we had given it up to somebody else. Yeah, I mean, fine distinction between made equi U.S. equipment and equipment made in the U.S. I mean, they are cold firearms rifles, um, but they had been signed. You know, they've been signed over to the ANSDF, um, along with Humvees and MRAPs, and I mean, just it's tragedy. Don't, I don't, I don't want to put any more. I don't want to seem like I'm making this seem not as bad as it is, but yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. When we surrender other things, like there's certain things we just leave behind. I mean, we both have seen the bone yards, MRAPs being cannibalized for other parts and everything. How much, like, how does the calculus work on that when you have all of this stuff that's there? I mean, in theory, you could go out with a welder and some time and you could assemble some pretty crazy stuff just from our, our waste. And a lot of times our waste is... Like you and I both talked yesterday about um, at the end in Iraq, a lot of these Humvees were just old, worn out machines that could barely function. I mean, we couldn't get over a curb in this one Humvee I was in because it was just it was shot. It 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 had it needed a serious retrofit, or in this case, you would just get rid of it and get a new one. Yeah, when I was a major uh, in Afghanistan, which was as young as I, I grew up in the Iraq War, I didn't start going to Afghanistan until 2010. Um, so, but when I was there as a young major with limited perspective, I saw this yard in Bagram full of these MRAPs that were being put on trains, sent up to Mezi Sharif on the north side of the, of the tunnel and, um, and being cut up. And I thought, what a waste, what a tragic waste. Fast forward eight years later, I'm a colonel in charge of CENTCOM logistics. And I'm like, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to figure out why we're doing this and I'm going to fix it. Um, it, it, you know, and it turns out. When you do the math on drawing things out of theater, you're counting 20 fit equivalent units, you're counting tons, and you're counting people. 
And it is one of the most remote and difficult uh, infrastructures in the world deliberately. Um, the, and there's, you know, we could do a sidetrack on history between the Russian kingdom and the British Commonwealth and how they both deliberately left Afghanistan void of infrastructure in the 1800s to make it difficult for India to get in a war with Russia. But that's a whole different story. So there's not, there's no way to get things in or out easy except for flying them. And what we, uh, when you do the math at cost per C-17 and being able to put one MRAP in a C-17 at a time or two, um, it just, it just didn't make any sense. These old, outdated, broken down vehicles were, were basically worth the steel. They were worth the steel that they had. So what we, what we were doing is we were getting them up to uh, Mezzi Sharif, cutting them down into steel and then training the steel out of the only railhead in the country at the time, which went north uh, into the stands and, and out that way, and just selling the steel. Um, you know, the, the number of C-17s in the United States is counted closely by Transcom. Where they go is being run every day by Transcom ops. It, we're, it's, we're not infinite. These things are carefully planned, um, and every movement is expensive to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, there was no appetite, at least when I was there, for, hey, let's send one of our precious C-17s to go lift out a piece of junk steel out of Mezzi Sharif. Like, there's just no, no one, no one was going to do that. And, and frankly, it wasn't worth the taxpayers' money to, to spend, you know, half a million dollars that way when really what you want is you just want it to go away and you don't want it to fall into enemy hands, which, as you know, is kind of what we're talking about. I, I don't know. Uh, how many MRAPs were up in that boneyard in Mezzi Sharif when the Germans left it? Um, I, I do know that when I was in charge of the demill program, they were not having a problem demilling. The pace of demilling was accelerating beyond the pace of MRAPs that needed to be cut up. Um, but I do know that we signed a lot of MRAPs over. You know, we had when we when we drew down in Syria and when we do drawdowns in general and and you know when I was there we iteratively planned a rapid drawdown out of Afghanistan as if hey this could happen tomorrow what would we do um, so there were plans on the shelf and the plans they counted three categories it was twenty foot equivalent units which is a cargo container uh, people and tonnage and you and, and you're reporting how many of each category both in normal equipment and sensitive equipment and people. And it needs to come out. Um, there, there were if so we planned that very, very carefully. And Pete, if I'm going on the wrong aspect, let me know. You can bring me back on track. But I think you're helping us all understand it. So, uh, but okay. So there, there is a planning element going on, and there's also a what if kind of planning element. Like, what if we leave? How long do we need? So when when the boss comes to us and says we're leaving. You guys go, oh, okay, great. We've got a, we've got a, you know, 50 day, a hundred day, uh, whatever it is plan, you know, which one do you want to pull on? So, so that stuff all exists. Let's talk a little bit about the qualifications of the people at, at the highest level. Cause it's, it's super impressive what these, these master level logisticians do and, and how they educated in their career and how, I mean, how incredible it is the their ability to do that. Can you talk a little bit about like the resumes of these people and what they've Oh, I, I have enormous respect for, uh, and you've heard me say it for some of these folks. Um, you know, it's hard to be a pilot. Let's start there. Like everybody goes in the Air Force and something like a third of a percent get to be pilots. And the ones that do are usually the top of their class, the sharp kids. When they were 21, they're sharp kids. And they've been doing, uh, they, they become C-17 pilots or whatever. Uh, and they do that their whole life. They think through lift and logistics and movement. Uh, and that's on the Air Force side. In the Army side, you know, the the big Army has one unique role in the battlefield, which is the provision of joint logistics. That's the Army's role. Um, the, the, the Air Force helps. The Navy shapes it. Uh, but really, if you want to move thousands of people and tons and tons of stuff, uh, you're really looking at the Army um, and then the Army working through Transcom. And these are, you know, it's unfair. It does them a discredit to kind of pop in like I did late in my career and go, Hey, I'm, I'm going to play logistician today. When there are people who, you know, literally have got their undergrad in logistics who spent their whole life doing it, who have masters yeah. and doctors in it. And not only that, who, who've been doing it their whole life. I would argue that in the history of man from the Roman empire forward, there has not been an organization with the reach, the incredible reach 
and professional push that the United States has right now. I mean, the very fact that we keep, you know, C-141s full of fuel on racetracks over the Atlantic and Pacific so that planes can reach across to anywhere in the world with nearly unlimited range, that that just should blow your mind. Like, if you're not impressed by that, uh, you probably were not born in the 1900s. You're, you're, you're a young kid who doesn't know what's going on. Um, you know, I, when you talk about conflicts with other nations, the thing that China lacks that the U.S. has is strategic and operational reach like that. You know, there is no there is no capability for China through mid-air refueling to put 10,000 people into California within 24 hours. It just doesn't exist. But the U.S. does it, and we don't even blink. We're just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that, that's just going to happen. We're going to move, you know, what? as a matter of fact, I'm indignant if it doesn't. Why can't we move more than 16,000 people a day from godforsaken Afghanistan to Fort McCoy, Wisconsin? I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible, the, the people that are involved in that. Open up the incredible ball too, because you know you and I are going to go put ten thousand people into the uh, you know whatever the desert basin over here in Southern California. We're just going to go to J three Air and task it, and they're going to be like, yeah, okay, yeah. Right. make sure there's no fuel in there. <laughs> it's like they do it. right. simple things to do, and they do it. Uh, you're not kidding; that's real. But I'm also saying the letter J because not only does the Army do this for you know a combined effort, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Space Force, uh, Coast Guard. But also, whoever our partner nation on, you know, partner nations are in these things. We yeah. look at this like this is a U.S. thing, but we're just we're just the main logistician hub. And we talk a little bit about how incredible that is to be able to work across multinational lines and do this stuff at the professional level. Yeah, that, especially in Afghanistan, if we, since that's the topic du jour, you know, it's important to note. Uh, I I was shocked when I first got into uh, to Afghanistan to to work closely with the 1st Panzer Division, uh, a unit I'd only ever read about in the World War II history books. And here they are up in Mezzi Sharif, you know, training Afghan soldiers on how to be better, uh, better combat engineers at the time, actually. Um, yeah, you know, it, it was an international war that we just ended up losing, but we, it, it was. The, the Italians were out in Herat. Uh, the French were there. The Germans, the Germans kept a huge element up north. There was a big Luftwaffe base. Uh, up north and the and and the northern sector wasn't just German most of our time there. It was German, Swedish, like all the Scandinavian nations in Germany were up in that northern corridor. The US of the five commands in country really only held down for most of the war, the eastern and the southern parts. So that, that'd be Kandahar and then around Ghazni area in general or Kabul, however you want to see it, with with, oh by the way, how's this for Dicey given the events in Syria, the Turks securing Kabul for the last 20 years. Um, interesting, you know, and, and, and you're right, uh, provision of joint logistics using NATO construct logistics. So that's the way it make you know, you wouldn't almost be able to do that if you didn't have common bullets, common gas, uh, things we take for granted. But under a NATO logistics construct, all those partner nations, I'm saying it um, kind of conversationally, but you got to imagine people working through fuel transaction sheets that transfer fuel between nations on common NATO logistics forms. Um, you know, tons and tons of staff work and thought and planning that goes into being able to lend, you know, another nation fuel or, or bullets or equipment, just being able to hand another nation uh, sensitive items and go, here, this is now yours, uh, takes a fair amount of work as well. Yeah. It does. If, if, if I can, can I talk about Bagram for a minute? The, 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 um, there was a lot. So the decision to turn Bagram over and go with Kabul, uh, in my understanding, resides with the White House. And I don't want to get into that. We can get into that later. But there was this fury about the handover in Bagram. And I knew a little bit about what went on inside that handover. So here's kind of how it went. The U.S. took everything out of Bagram they wanted, and Bagram was the primary log hub. And most everything came out of the crisp yard, which is the uh, the, the yard for uh, return and demill of equipment or, or retrograde. The, the crisp yard's empty. The base is fairly empty. Uh, they're going to turn it over to the ANSDF. And, and they're going to do this in the middle of the night because they don't want to do it in the daytime. It's too visible. It could be a security risk. We're going to do this at midnight. So the U.S. troops uh, kind of coordinated with the local commander daily. Hey, we're leaving at midnight on this day. Uh, we need you to come in at night, meet us here, occupy the base, and we're going to move out. And, and the only thing left on the base is what we're giving you for, for equipment, right? Um, 
They didn't show. Like, it just didn't show. Uh, and so they postponed the handover. They're like, well, they didn't show, so I guess we'll try again tomorrow night. Uh, they tried again the next night, and the NSDF just didn't show up in the middle of the night. Like, they showed up the next morning at 10, but they didn't show up in the middle of the night. So at, at some point, uh, after this happening several times, uh, the commander on the ground is like, look, the only things here are yours. Uh, it's all already been signed over to you. We're just leaving. And so they just left. And by the by the time they left until 10 in the morning, obviously, uh, there were other elements that got into Bagram, not Taliban so much as looters, and et cetera. But when, you know, when the ANSDF did show up at 10 o'clock the next morning and the base had been empty for 10 hours, uh, that there was a lot of hue and cry that, that, that it had been handled poorly or that, that American equipment had been given away. And it, it wasn't quite the case. When you have a partner force that won't show up for these things, I mean, look, the ground truth guy and me, I'm looking at passive aggressive things. You're saying you're going to show up, not show up. Something's been missed in that cultural decision making process to where the partner is like, yeah, that's great. Thanks for the thanks for the Air Force Base. We're leaving. You know, we're not into it. Um, yeah. Who owns that problem? Because, I mean, somewhere, someone somewhere, some some colonel or general said, you know, this is on me. I buttoned it up. We're going. We're leaving. You know, and then there is someone holding the bag. Uh, I think ultimately, in that case, it was um, ultimately General Miller. I mean, that that was a time when he was still there. I think if I got my timing right, because he left in June. Um, but, you know, that, having worked all those angles in my previous lives, that would have gone to the J three ops, the ops floor in Kabul. They would have made a decision on um, retrograde, and and it would have been approved either by the J three of. Uh, the Afghan command or, or, or the commander. I do know also, I want to reiterate that the, everyone in the unit on the uniform side recommended that Bagram be the last base. And that's a really tricky decision. You know, we, we, we look at that. I think as we look back on the war, uh, we'll see that there were a couple big mistakes that I'm willing to talk about today that we made. And I think one of them is clearly the decision to rely on uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport as our final log node and not Bagram. And everyone on the military side uh, recommended Bagram. That was the recommended course of action at every level of command from uh, Afghan Afghanistan all the way through CENTCOM. And I'm just roughly using the Afghan command because it's changed names three times in the last two years. So I'm just going <laughs> to shorthand that. Yeah. Um, when, when Scotty Miller left, it changed names again. Um, so the, the idea on the military side was to use use Bagram as the final air base um, for very good reasons. I think that's a difficult decision. Uh, the, the guidance from the White House was you need to use Kabul. Kabul will allow the NSDF and the Afghan government to see us till the last minute. Kabul will allow us to be closer to the people that we may need to evacuate. Kabul will give us a closer linkage to the combined the other national forces, uh, th there was some logic uh, to, hey, let's show the flag in the capital to the last minute and have Kabul be the last base was the political guidance. And it had a lot to do with what France was going to see and what England was going to see. And what would Germany think if we pulled out of the capital and withdrew to our air base in the mountains and left them in downtown Kabul by themselves? So there was an international strategic political decision made not a tactical decision to, to, to use Kabul over Bagram. I think it was a mistake. I think that's one of the great mistakes of this drawdown. Um, but, you know, we ought to consider both angles carefully without just dismissing whoever made that decision as an idiot. It was made uh, as a deliberate international political calculation. Um, I don't think it was a mistake. I want to wrap up the equipment side because I do have one more question about that. Should this, have we given... Were we hasty in assigning all of its equipment over to the Afghans, given what, I mean, from what I knew, I mean, I expected an instant collapse because the machines work at the ground level. If you can't put bullets into a warrior's hand and they say, go out and fight, if you can't reliably pay these people, if they're eating scraps, man, the next best deal coming along, they're going to leave, you know? 
So I wasn't surprised to see this thing crumble. But were, were we hasty with this? Did this need more time? What are your thoughts on, I mean, all this stuff goes over. I mean, can the Taliban even, we know they can make trucks and generators and all that kind of stuff work, but can they stay in the air with a Blackhawk? I mean, could they, can they actually fly any kind of jet reliably? I mean, I don't even know how they would get jet fuel. Uh, to, to, I'll answer both questions in sequence. Um, it was, you know, we haven't really been fighting in Afghanistan, U.S. troops, for a lot of years. And if you're there on the ground working with the NSDF in, let's say, summer of 2020, they're losing thousands of men a month. You're watching them lose thousands of men a month fighting your enemies. And you're trying to tell them, hey, we're on your side, but you're not going out on patrol. You're not out there with them, really, except for a few small elements. Uh, American casualties trickle to nothing, which was the plan. Um, but the NSDF are cutting and bleeding every day. And there was a lot of great Americans who were doing everything they could to get the NSDF the best equipment they could to fight that fight and w- with a big with a big charitable heart. Like, you guys are dying by the thousands. We're going to give you what you need. We're going to be here and help you with this. Um, I don't think we were hasty. I don't. Um, I, I think we were appropriately, you know, we were trying to build a 500,000 man army. We provided 600,000 rifles. Did we provide a couple extra? Okay, maybe. They were losing rifles. When you lose 2,000 men a month, you lose 2,000 rifles because they get taken. Um, I mean, you, these are people's brothers and sisters and fathers. And, and you know, the, the toll of the war on the Afghan National Security Forces was very high. I mean, in some months, they were losing as many as, in a month as we lost in the whole war. I don't think we were hasty in providing that equipment. And is there another path that we could have taken? I mean, if, if you don't provision these guys with American equipment, they certainly don't stay around. Right. Well, yeah, as we saw. <laughs> um, you know, the, the defense military industrial complex makes its money on the maintenance contract, not the buy, not the car, not the sticker shock. They'll give you the Blackhawk. Then they're going to charge you for maintenance for 25 years. That's how that's how the American business machine works on the mill side. Everything that you have there needs enormous amounts of maintenance. It's almost designed to, especially in my field, in, in the counter IED uh, combat engineer field. I mean, the, 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 the maintenance programs for the software, the hardware, the robots, the Blackhawks, the Blackhawk onboard software, like all that stuff is designed to need an enormous maintenance tail. If the Taliban take that equipment, uh, it's not going to work for long. I mean, I, I say that, and you and I talked a little bit about this before. Um, I'm humble in that those guys seem to be able to make anything work. Like, they're the best mechanics on the planet. Uh, they, they can turn lawnmowers into machine guns somehow. They're, they're just amazingly innovative uh, with their hands-on mechanic capability. That said, none of that equipment's going to work for long. Not the, not the Tacanos, not the Blackhawks, not anything sophisticated. And the other thing I'll say that I've really thought a lot about is what is the real strategic impact of guys who already have rifles having more rifles? Like what? It wasn't like the Taliban was short rifles a year ago and now they have enough. Like I, I don't know if this changes anything. And I don't know if you'd prefer a cold firearm over a 7.62 Kalashnikov anyway for what the kind of work. I mean, um, I, I don't know if this does anything other than mili- you know, rearm angry people throughout the region, but I, I don't think there was ever a shortage of rifles in Afghanistan. From what I saw, uh, most of them being shot, you know, at us, they didn't seem to have a shortage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a great point. That's a great point. And they, what does, uh, I'm, I'm going to be hard on the commanders here for a minute. The people who own battle space, you know, their that first line item on their mission statement is closed with the destroy the enemy. They sure as hell couldn't do it reliably. You couldn't reliably make dead Taliban show up. Um, I guess apparently we could make dead Afghan security forces show up, but the other end was really tough to pull off. And so you have all this military capacity just waiting in the hills for us to start, you know, bringing down our Black Lives Matter flag and American flag from the embassy. As a plan, and I'm I'm making a joke here because they're playing a different game than we are. So when when you look at this and and I'm taking kind of a circuitous route here, but you were getting a master's degree at basically the most revered uh, institution in the military. And then they said, hey, never mind all that. Go work on help us figure out this Afghan strategy. And you got to talk to everybody you wanted to, you and your peers. 
to, to write this paper. So when we're talking strategy, we're talking to the guy. I mean, we're talking, you know, you understand what we were trying to do, the best paths and that kind of thing. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, how we approach this fight because it was hard. And, and I, want to, I also want to say this again. I totally agree. Like the, Afghanistan is so rugged, so impossible to move around in. We lose track of the, the fact that just driving out to some of these remote, if you, if you were one or two counties off of the main route, you were in a different world. There's very little help coming. Maybe there would be a jet that flies overhead. But for the most part, you were on your own. And if someone didn't bring you food, you couldn't stay out there. And by bring you food, I mean from the air, provisioning it, you know. So it is an exceptionally tough environment to operate in. But talk about the development of the strategy. What were we trying to do? What did you guys figure out as you went through this whole learning process? Yeah, um, yeah. The terrain is really rough. I think if, if you haven't seen the movie The Outpost, it's worth watching because it gives a sense of the fact that you couldn't even get vehicles in. Um, but that's tactics. So let's talk strategy for a minute because there's a lot of people with tactical time and not a lot with strategy. And I will say, that, uh, thanks for the intro. I, I did get a chance to work strategy at the highest levels. And whenever I talk about this, I always start with the following kind of joke, right? I got to work strategy for Afghanistan at the NSC level with some of the biggest names in strategy, you know, Reed, HR McMaster, Dave Petraeus, et cetera. That, that's either really impressive, or, but, but we wrote the Afghan strategy. So, to, you know, we're not that, obviously we didn't do that well, right? So, um, but in a lot of sense, it allows me to have the perspective of being they, like what did they, what were they trying to do? I will say, um, the strategic problem uh, is the fissure between India and Pakistan and that Pakistan defines itself as a nation fighting to spread Islam. Like that's their national identity because of how they were born, because of the split uh, with the Hindu in the 40s and the way the British partitioned India. You know, the, the, every nation has a raison de terre. The French are protecting their culture. The Americans want to spread democracy. Pakistan is fighting for Islam against the Hindu. And the complexities down inside that nation, which is divided within itself in that, is that the madrasas are turning out, you know, thousands of students, Talib in Pashto being the word for student, um, thousands and thousands and thousands to the tune of sometimes upwards of 30, 40,000 Taliban being created a year at these madrasas where they're taking young men from all over the Arab and, and Islamic world, and they're radicalizing them, arming them, and turning them out to do, in their view, God's work. The ANSDF could not beat the Taliban. I mean, they lost to the Taliban because they weren't recruiting 30,000 a year. They couldn't, they didn't, first of all, they don't have the people. Afghanistan doesn't have the population. Um, and, and so that's the strategic problem. Now, how do you fix that problem if you're American and you understand that the Taliban aren't really after Afghanistan? They want to kill the great Satan. They want to get out in the world and kill the West and kill the great Satan. That's that's their, you know, and they want to help anyone else who wants that. How do you how do you fight that? What do you do about that? Well, obviously, there's the whole we should have invaded Pakistan, take the war to the Pakistanis, you know, but, but you got to remember that when you watch the Black Hawk Down movie, uh, there's a Pakistani armored column that pulls our guys out of Mogadishu because they're allies at that point. Ever since Nixon went there in 71, which I think was a terrible strategic error, we, we in the 70s, we had to pick between Pakistan or India as our big ally. And in order to get our foot in the door with China, we picked Pakistan. And when India fought Pakistan, we put a carrier group off the coast of India and threatened uh, PM Gandhi at the time, female Gandhi, um, and made an enemy of, of India for 30 years and a friend of Pakistan. So that's where the cards stood on the table in 2000 when we picked up the game. Um, so there, there are a logistics corridor, there are ally. So the strategy was simply this, when, when I was working on it, it was someone's got to fight the Taliban. Uh, Pakistan's the only place in the world with nukes that are loose. And we only inspect a fraction of a percent of the containers that come in the port at New York, any one of those nukes could be put on a container, shipped into the harbor at New York and transitioned in the United States and driven under the Capitol building and lit off, right? Um, so where do you control the nukes and where do you control the spread of the Taliban? You do it at the source. And the only ones willing to stand up to the Taliban coming out of the madrasas was the ANSDF. And they're fighting and cutting and bleeding every day for it. 
So what are you, so how do you, do you, what do you do? Do you leave and just let them, what do you, what do you do in 2015 or 2017 when I was working on it? What's the plan? What, what's a good idea? And I love your monograph. I'd recommend it to anybody, you know, starting with the understanding that whatever your idea is, it probably sucks because, you know, this is a lot harder than you think it is. So the idea was uh, that we would keep enough people there that the ANSDF would keep fighting the Taliban and keep killing the Taliban in the mountains of the Hindu Kush, but a low enough number that we would stop taking casualties and that we would stay off the news. You know, one of the anecdotes we, we use when we we're thinking about this is who's, who's a, where's the outcry that we're occupying the Sinai and securing the Suez Canal? There is no outcry because nobody knows, nobody cares. There's, there's 3,000 Americans that are actually in contact, by the way. They, they're in direct fire contact out there in the Sinai Peninsula with some uh, some uh, nefarious elements. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but nobody cares because nobody's being killed and the cost is low and it's off the radar. That was the model that was supposed to be for Afghanistan was keep, you know, keep three to 10,000 there. Keep bolstering the, the spine of the NSDF. Make it a low cost low political cost mission and stay. That was the strategy that we came up with when we looked at it. And I, I think it went wrong. Uh, the place I think it went wrong. What, what, oh, by the way, the Trump administration bought that strategy, meaning he endorsed that plan. And the, that strategy had a heavy screw Pakistan angle, probably half the strategic plan because it was a strategic plan. So it's dime. We call it diplomatic, informational, military, economic plan. It was sanctions against Pakistan, diplomatic pressure against Pakistan. I mean, there was a lot of take it to the Pakistanis politically, diplomatically, economically until they get this madrasa problem under control. Meanwhile, militarily bolster the NSDF with a couple thousand guys. That's the strategy. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, I'll keep this unclass, but you want to provide platforms for CIA guys to do other things that they need to do to control the news. Just leave it at that. Um, when we announced, so, so the Trump administration bought that plan. They went from 80,000 to 25,000. I helped them do that with drawdown. I was in log logistics when they did that drawdown. Then they went from 25,000 down to 2,500. High risk at this point. Is 2,500 enough to bolster the NSDF spine and carry the strategy? Turns out, yes. For the end of the fighting season in 2020, it turns out that was enough. The minute we came online and said very publicly, strategically, we're leaving. Every last man and woman and child and piece of equipment is leaving by September 11th, 2021. The minute we made that publicly, internationally, that strategic move, it completely broke the back of the NSDF and it broke their morale. And within months, they folded, um, you know, like a deck of cards. That move to announce it. Uh, it reminds me of, I always mock, and I know you've seen this, you've probably been in the room and they've had this conversation, when someone has the great idea, and uh, thanks for mentioning that monograph, by the way, I, I love that, but someone will say, I see a brown hand clasping a white hand on a PowerPoint slide. They're like, please stop. And so when they when someone is adorable and they're like, oh, let's leave on 9-11. No, let's leave on the date that makes the most sense in terms of, of this is well, you know, but we didn't do that because apparently political decisions are different. I'm hyper, hyper, hyper critical of Joe Biden and Secretary Austin. They both have done two drawdowns and they both have gone terribly, terrible, right? Drawdowns are hard, especially in this case. You know, don't tell me it's not going to be like Saigon. And you're like, you're right, it's worse. But let's talk a little bit candidly about how these things can go. Let's not talk about the boss and his screw up and everything else. There's plenty of stuff to do with that. But let's talk about how these things are supposed to go. You've done a, you've got, done a drawdown in, in Syria. I'm sure you've been part of the Iraqi drawdown. But how are these things? I was. I was working at the, um, in the Iraq drawdown. I was at the core had three-star command level uh, as a planner when that, in, in 10 and 11. When we did the first, the first drawdown, Iraq drawdown V1, the one that didn't work. That's the one I was part of. Is this in 2011 when I'm in a uh, chow hall with a bunch of field artillery guys and President Obama's like, all combat troops have left? You know, and I'm like, I'm in Baghdad. 
on night patrols <laughs> unescorted by the local host nation with field artillery guys. Granted, we're not shooting long gun missions, but th- what is more combat than that? You know, going outside the wire with a bunch of field artillery. These are combat units. I, I think the hardest military mission that I've ever planned or been a part of is a non-combatant evacuation operation. Uh, like the one we did in Beirut, you know, when, when you go, when you have to go in and try to find every free radical American citizen in a hostile environment and under a time pressure and get them out, I think that there, there isn't, I mean, there are, I can't think of a, an operation that's more dangerous for the troops, harder to pull off strategically and operationally, and then even tactically. I mean, you literally got to go dropping guys on roofs to go grab families and get them into helicopters and get them out of the way like that is high adventure. What does it look like? Avoid that. I mean, you know, what what you want to do is you want to have the time and we didn't this time, but you want to have the time. And we did in Iraq uh, where you can say, Hey, you know, in six months, we need all Americans to be out of here. And like good Americans, you know, in little LGOPs, little groups of paratroopers, like free radicals, we need you all to leave by this date. And they all get out of the way and there's much less of a problem. I think that w- went really well in Iraq uh, in 2011. So for all my like poking at, at, at our own thing, you know, there weren't, there weren't reports of a lot of Americans caught by ISIS when ISIS overran the northern part of the country. There was that Christian tragedy. There was a lot of internationals caught, but there was not a lot of Americans caught. And there were a lot of Americans in Mosul at the time and in Fallujah at the time. So that, that I think, is what better looks like. Uh, what, what is going on now is just tragic in that with the, you know, I think no matter how experienced you are at it, people underestimate the effects of morale on the battlefield. And when the Afghan army crumbles in a day, you know, a lot of people are caught with their pants down. And, and it, it, to note, if you're like, well, you know, Biden should have known that or the president should have known that the intel agents on the ground whose profession it is to know that didn't see it coming and their lives depended on it. So it wasn't like they saw it coming and they didn't want to report it or the report didn't get up to the right guy. Like the people on the ground who are running intel collection networks in order to preserve their own lives didn't see it coming this fast. Um so that, that's to be noted is that, you know, rapid moral and psychological collapse of an army, I, I think always takes everyone a, l- a little bit by surprise. But when it happened, it happened so fast that people are, people are just stuck. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It happened fast. So one of the things you talked about is believing that we're actually leaving. Are you talking about us believing it or are we talking about, you know, the locals believing it? Because when you talk about like so there's a lot of talk in the media in general and and on facebook and whatnot saying well people should have just started leaving eight months ago or whatever it was right but that's not how these things work you actually have to have this order this plan like you are now tasked to box up your box and head to bagram you know whatever it is and so yeah we know we're leaving we know there's a date in the wall but you don't believe that until someone's like we're packing up tomorrow and we're leaving I mean, these days right, right. have to happen in a certain order. It doesn't appear that we did that. It doesn't appear that, that look, some people are going to stay no matter what, for whatever reason it is. But most of the government entities, the contract companies they're in, most of those people are going to do what the, the customer, the client says, which in this case would be the United States government. So how the hell did we, how the hell did we get this so wrong? How did we not know how many Americans were there? And, and why is it that, you know, for months, people have been screaming about getting these Afghan interpreters and other assets out of the country since we're pulling out. And it was not a priority on anybody's list who could make it happen. It was hard to get visas and everything else. So what the hell happened? Oh, they just weren't ready. I mean, they, they, there was a plan. Well, you know what? I can't even say that. That, that. that even gives too much credit because they should have been ready to be out by September, right? I mean, that was the stated, overtly stated timeline. Every time I've done Afghan drawdown planning, there's been this variable. And the variable is the number of contractors. Uh, Contractors generally belonging to other three-letter agencies that nobody wants to disclose where are, how many there are, what they're being paid. I mean, you got this, you got 2,500 troops and 15,000 plus contractors. Um, Hmm. That's always tough to get a hold of because those guys don't punch in a clock every morning. Like, hey, I'm here. It's eight in the morning. I came into work. Like, you know, they're... 
they're at some level of Intel network development, which is kind of a highly classified business, but it's like, if you get paid a hundred bucks a year to tell us if you see Taliban driving by, does that mean you're an American asset or just a guy we're paying a hundred bucks a year to tell us, if, you know, wh- wh- where does, what, what status are you in? Sure. So it's very fuzzy because it's highly classified Intel networks are, and then to what degree are you actually on our side or not is a very fuzzy line. I mean, you got to think through all the mechanics of double agentry to know that there were, there were probably, and I'm, I'm hopefully this isn't classified. I don't have any classified access to this. So hopefully I'm not tripping any wires, but you know, there were probably guys in the Taliban who were being paid to give us information. Think about that for a minute. If we're paying Taliban guys to spy on the Taliban, and surely we are, I, I, I'm presuming, I don't have any classified access to that because I don't do that. But are we flying that guy home to Wisconsin because he's earned it? Like this is a Taliban soldier that we're paying a thousand bucks a year to tell us where he is. Does he get flown to Wisconsin and evac with everyone else? Like it's very fuzzy. It just is. It's a fuzzy art to, you know, how many people are considered U.S. allies um, what what U.S. citizens are there is pretty clear. Uh, why they're there, you know, I, I I think we have a responsibility to get every U.S. citizen out. I, I have a hard time feeling compassion for, uh, you know, the kid that goes there on adventure tourism a month before the NSDF collapses. It's hard to get, get your head around feeling like a, like a Marine should waste his life trying to find that kid. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, when you're looking at an international intelligence effort, Defining who is on your side, who is on your payroll, and who should be evac is a very fuzzy and nebulous problem. As far as traditional, like the state, the embassy staff, and like the actual army units, I'm, I'm, I have seen nothing to indicate that those folks didn't draw down in, sh- in fair order and take their equipment with them. How much blame, I mean, I'm pretty hard on Joe Biden. You don't have to say this if you can't because you're, you know, being active in your service, but how much blame do you put at Joe Biden's feet? I mean, Kamala Harris leaves the room. It's just Joe. He's deciding stay or go. How much, how much? I would would just say this. Um, First of all, someone wrote me this morning and said McKinsey should retire right now. Think about that for a second. Hmm. Should, Should he? I mean, um, is it responsible to change command in the middle of a crisis? You know, he's good friends with Mattis. Mattis, as we know, retired over the Syria drawdown. He didn't believe we should draw down Syria and he retired. He quit or was fired, however you want to look at it, um, talking about accountability. But he waited till after the crisis to, uh, to transition. And I think that's importantly, I think that's responsible leadership that you don't abandon ship in the middle of a crisis, that you at least see it through uh, the, current, the current crisis. So I know you're asking about Biden, but I just want to talk about generals and because there's a big outcry for all the generals should get fired and maybe they should. I mean, we have too many generals. That's for sure. We have a hell of a lot more generals per soldier now than we ever had in the history of the country. But when you say that, when anyone says that, think about just I would just ask the audience to think through for what specifically. Like, just ask yourself that, like, for what decision President, I think the Americans have made, I think America has made two strategic errors. One, picking Kabul over Bagram. It was a tough decision. I think they picked the wrong one. Two, announcing publicly the timeline of the drawdown. I think that was probably, um, I say that at risk, and that's why I'm not wearing my uniform right now. That's a personal thought, not my professional opinion. Um, should the Biden administration step down over that? Should Joe Biden step down over that? I, I, I will say that for I'll just take, I'll crib my comments to the military because that's what I know the most about. The guys who make four-star general are basically working for the American people for free, right? Like they could make more money retiring and they're never going to another job. They're not getting promoted. They're not going anywhere special. Like if you retire these people, you're not hurting them. Your, their wives will thank you. Um, do, do you want to like publish, like publicly retire them so they can go write their book and punish them? Just be clear about for what, right? I mean, McKinsey didn't make the decision on Bagram and McKinsey didn't make the decision on the announcement timeline. Um, should Scotty Miller come out publicly and retire at this point? I don't I mean, he was following the strategy that he was given by his national leadership. There, there is. Um, so I'll say that. And the other thing I'll say on that is, you know, falling on your sword to prove a point 
doesn't actually help anybody. Like, it, you know, Scotty Miller could come out and retire. Frank McKenzie could come out and go, oh, I'm going to, you know, I hate this plan. I'm retiring in protest. But it doesn't help the people in Afghanistan. I mean, it doesn't help anybody. It makes nothing better except for now we have a different general in charge and we have to do a transition ceremony. Um, I, I'm not sure that's worth it. I, I think the way Mattis did it in protest politically was elegant. I think, I think a lot of Mattis. Um, but but you wouldn't do that during the crisis. It'd just be almost irresponsible. When we look at all of the moves now being made, you and I both know a lot of people who are working very hard on trying to stabilize this mess. Uh, and they're doing this in spite of, by, with, and through whatever the, the U.S. government. I mean, I know of people, look, there's money to be spent. There's people that have money. Like, I have money. I don't have the ability to go do this. Um, who can I hire or who can I give money to so they go take care of this? And so let, let's, let's just be frank here. There's a whole lot more mercenary action than there ever is normally because there are folks that are investing in that. And there are, there are hard dudes that love doing hard business that didn't get enough hard business who are going to go back and mm-hmm. go do what they think is necessary. And this is in part because of that decision by the boss, right? And there's a lot of these decisions where you look at it, it does not make sense to be in this position. Granted, the, uh, the Taliban taking over so quickly. Uh, through the plans into chaos, but you and I both know negative 10 degrees, January, calm. That's a warm day. You know, this is way harder for anybody. The Taliban is not an out, like it's an outdoor force. They live outdoors. They eat whatever is available. They are hardy, but they're not Afghan winter hardy. They're, they're going to go to ground. Why didn't we just wait six months? And then this, and this infuriates me when, um, when the president's like, hey, I'm bound by this deal. Bullshit. You're the most powerful man in the world. You can put an aircraft carrier group off the coast of, of any nation if you choose to. You can absolutely have a brigade stay in an area and be like, you know what? You guys are messing around. We don't leave until I say so. You know, And I dare you to say otherwise because he'll be held to pay. But he doesn't. And not only does he not do it, I'm really hammering hard on Joe Biden. He disappears. He goes on fucking vacation and he doesn't talk. You know, so there's a lot of problems with this. When you look at the leadership side, and let's take Joe Biden out. Why, why not wait six months? Who cares about you know, September 11th? What, what matter are American lives? I mean, that's that's what we're all trying to defend here. Right. Why? Um, why the leadership fiasco of creating this humanity crisis, this this the Taliban are going to reap people no matter what. And that's, that's on us because we brought this fight to, to them. But it just seems like there's a lot of incompetence at the very top. How can I, how can I answer that without uh, getting myself? Cause there's some of that, like I just, my ethics are, I almost can't answer, but I will say this. Don't. If I were to decide, let me, Pete, let me say this. If I were to decide when to leave, um, I would not do it during the summer fighting season. I would not do it when the ANSDF are tired. And I would, I would absolutely do it in the cold because we're an all weather force. And I would ensure that it was in no way linked to September 11th because it smacks of defeat. So if I were to make the decision, those are some of the things I would, I would consider. You would advise the, 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 the boss to do how hard. Okay. So you're general Austin, you're that last line of defense, probably one of the last military people to speak to Joe before he makes the decision. Is this what is Secretary Austin feeling? Do you think? I mean, how you know that's a great point. Um, uh, because I got to see, I got to hear, I wasn't in the room and I don't, I don't want to pretend to know the man, but I did get to hear Mattis talk about his decision making a little bit before he went. And it's a really, um, it's a really gut wrenching decision when you're the sec def and your president wants you to do something that you don't believe in. And your options at that point are to resign any influence, like walk away, take all your experience, your life of service, and give up the playing field to somebody else who's going to do whatever the president says. Or do you keep the influence, keep the position, and try to shape it from there? Uh, that Think about that for a minute. Like if, if you're only motivated by service to the American people, your president you think is wrong, you're telling him he's wrong, he's bowling you over. Do you quit and go, you know what, President, get a 30-year-old yes man? Does that help the American people? 
Cause that's what he's going to do. Like you quit and he's going to go, okay, I'll take Bill. Bill always says, yes, he just go on, He nods whenever I'm in the room. Like he's my guy. I'll put Bill in there. Right. So do you really win as the sec def by stepping down? And if you, the answer is yes and no, I mean, you make a big political statement, but you also yield the, the counter. You might've been the one voice in the national security council that was a voice of reason. And now you've given up that capability. And so I know uh, when Mattis was thinking through that, he talked about the, the art of falling on your sword and the timing of that and when to do it. And, and that's ultimately the role. I mean, he, he was agonizing over that for over a year with the Trump administration. Um, so should Austin do that? Should Austin leave the room? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on between Austin and the president. Um, if, if, as you say, they're both just terrible at drawdowns and they both have been involved in some bad ones from Saigon to to, to uh, 2011, maybe he's just the wrong guy and maybe he needs to acknowledge that and step aside. I don't know, but I, I do know that that's a careful calculus. Uh, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard job what he's trying to do. And I just wonder, you know, cause he's had to stand up in front of the media and say, you know, I can't ensure the safety of all the Americans. I mean, that's what, what hurts, what hurts any service member more than have to say that out loud uh, to America. You know, that to know, and he knows. I mean, he knows. He he, as as much as I, I think, you know, he owns part of this this mistake and this fiasco. Uh, he also understands truly what it means to to get this this wrong. Yeah, and service, right? I mean, you got you got to thank that guy for a life of service. He's not making a bunch of money by being sector right now, right? I mean, that guy could be sitting on. He could be on his ranch with the other retired four stars playing golf. Uh, instead, he's waking up every day at five and going in to, to serve the American people. Like, you know, uh, that's tough. I, you know, I just got to say, um, I don't know how much time you're going to give me. You know, it's good to be. It helps me be compassionate and wise and respectful if I imagine it being me. I always put myself in that other person's shoes. And I've done that from the very beginning of the war to the current war to this to this conversation. Right. Like I remember being a soldier in 2003 and four and five. And, and in when I would sit in a bar and have a beer, people would say, why don't we go grab bin Laden? We should have that guy. And I always remember thinking to myself, who, who, who are you talking about? Like, who is willing in the winter to go into the Hindu Kush and hunt around in the mountains and just find this guy? Like you're entitled to have someone go do this for you. Would you do it? Would you do it? No, most Americans wouldn't. That's terribly painful. You know, um, Seriously. we should, we should have bin Laden. Why don't we, we should have evac every single American. Really? Like, who's going to do that? Are you going to do that? Are you going to go to Hakaya and you're going to go walk around outside the perimeter looking for Americans to grab? I mean, that's a tough, tough job. Right. And we have military forces. I'm not saying that they're, it's not their mission, but you got to be a little bit understanding. Just imagine if it was you. And, and I would say the same thing for the outcry of, you know, we should fire everybody. Well, okay. Who, for what decision, and what would you have done? Like, what would have your decision? Would you have done Kyle or Bagram? Think th think about it. I mean, I don't know. I, I could see it both ways. Would you have announced a drawdown timeline so that everyone knew when to leave, or would you have kept it under wraps? I, I mean, these are tough strategic decisions. Yeah, they are. They are. They're really tough. And and uh, I would say you announce a timeline and then do whatever the hell you needed to do. You know, leave early, leave late, whatever. Uh, but I would I would never be bound by a date. And you're right, though. If I'm in the room and the boss says we're going down path F, much as I don't like it, I got to give plan F my, my damnedest. You know, it's, it's shitty. But this is the plan. And this is the boss. He's the one that he's the one that holds the holds the ropes and has all the responsibility. But then again, Joe Biden is the one that called it. And oh, yeah. This has not gone well. So I don't know if it's constitutionally, uh, you know, like something he can be impeached for, but it's going to look the American people are going to, I would hope, vote accordingly, you know, to to provide whatever they think. But I think you don't have to comment on this. I'm just going to say this out loud for me on the record. Here's a guy that we're not at all surprised that he made a mistake because his career was born on mistakes. He's made the wrong call. Over and over again. Bob Gates has commented on this over and over and over again. And if we don't pick better people, if we don't pick people who are better at making these kind of decisions and judgments, then then we're going to get bad decisions over and over again. And let's understand this. Someone incredibly qualified like uh, President Hoover or President G.W. Bush or uh, the elder, Bush the elder, 
these guys are incredibly qualified to be president. They weren't terribly great presidents themselves. I mean, maybe they made good decisions and we can we can do machinations to get there, but it's a hard job. It's full of shitty decisions that you have to make. You, you said something that really resonated with me. Uh, well, a couple of things have actually that you've said, and which is why I'm a big fan. I'll just keep throwing that out there. But um, And you said, hey, this is a shitty plan, but this is the plan. I think every soldier who served in Afghanistan from 2002 to this moment has pretty much had that thought the entire time. Like, this is a shitty, difficult country. This is not a very good plan. We're going to do our best to make the best of it. This is not, I mean, make no mistake. There's nobody who's ever served in Afghanistan that went, wow, this is easy. This is a great, this is very clear. What a clear, good plan this is. We'll just walk around in the mountains until they love us and we'll find Osama bin Laden and kill him, even though we all know he's in Pakistan. Like, no one's ever thought, no one's ever thought Afghanistan was easy or a good plan. And then I've seen, and then I want to acknowledge one other thing without getting myself in trouble. I've seen us make strategic mistakes in my life as a soldier. And, you know, I've been to the schools that train strategists to advise people. I think I've seen us make disbanding the Ba'ath Party was a strategic mistake. Decommissioning the Iraqi army was a strategic mistake. Who got fired? Like who, what was, should, are we in, are we, I mean, thousands of Americans died because of those decisions. Um, are we in a sense of outrage about that? Maybe we should be. The decision, there were some strategic mistakes made this year that have led to a U.S. defeat. And that's, a, I, hopefully that's not my closing comment, but that's, because it's a tough one, but that, that's what happened. When, when I hear us talk about stri- strategists and grand strategies, where's the grand tactician? You know, you know me, I'm, I'm a ground truth guy. Like if that all makes sense, how do we make that reality happen out in, you know, district 15, nowhere near the middle of anywhere, you know, and, and bring that change that we're trying to bring so I can help contribute to the strategic win. And when you guys write that strategy, I'm imagining you don't have a, a ground truth expert. I, I think we lose track of the, uh, the vertical in terms of what it takes to accomplish these things. I mean, it's nice to say, hey, we're going to go build this fancy car. But if you're in the line, it's like, hey, we don't have any lugs or nuts. So we're just going to wire these these wheels on because you said we got to do it. So now we're using wheeling wire to hold these tires to these these hubs. And we've got to get better than that. We, we've, we've, I'm, I'm not saying you have to do so much analysis you get par- paralyzed, right? But I am saying that we have to attach reality to what our strategic and theoretic goals are. Yeah. So I, I you know, there's, I, I think we, maybe one thing um, that hasn't been said, I'm just making sure I'm clear to keep going. Um, people are coming out of the woodwork and going, Hey, the Afghan plan was never a good plan. It's always been difficult. It's a tough neighborhood. Uh, we, we just got to acknowledge that this has always been a very, very difficult mission. I mean, to try to, to try to build a stable democratic nation in Afghanistan um, is a tall order to say the least. Uh, and that's a nation that needs external support as always. It, it has never existed as a nation without external support. Um, and they almost need that. And they're going to look for it again. I guarantee you that. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I have answered your question there, but, but I, I do want to acknowledge that like anyone could come out of the woodwork and go, Hey, I was there in 2007. It was a bad plan then too. Yeah, it was. And I say that as a guy who helped write the plan, at least one of the iterations, uh, it was like the least crappy of a bunch of crappy plans that you could, you know, stay forever. That was my plan. That was my best intellectual effort was stay forever. Uh, Stay forever is not a great plan. I mean, that's. um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, damn it. I, look, I appreciate you coming on and dancing the dance, too. I, I know uh, if the audience doesn't know, I can appreciate what it means to be on active status and trying to, uh, you know, follow your ethics and, and not get yourself fired for saying something. So I appreciate that. These are your opinions and you gave them very carefully and, and uh, provide a lot of insight. I mean, we're all we're all hurting right now and we're trying to figure out, you know, man, what is going on? And I just. I, you know, I can't wrap my head around it either, but I also, if I was there, I'd be doing the same thing. All these guys are doing, you know, whatever my fighting position was, whatever I was doing collection or whatever it is, I'd be doing my job as best as I could. That's what everybody, no one goes to the military and does a drawdown at like 50% effort because it's just right. Work. 
I, I just, I have to say one thing, because uh, I, I think you're wrapping up and I think that's appropriate. Um, you know, when I was a captain in Afghanistan, I lost my first sergeant. As a company commander, I lost my first sergeant. Um, so I, 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 I would uh, feel poorly on myself if I didn't mention first sergeant Christopher Rafferty, who was killed uh, just east of Ghazni by a recoilless rifle uh, in an engagement. And w- yeah, we're hurting. I mean, people are hurting. Um, it's t- losing a war is tough, tough. And you ask yourself, what was it about? What did I just give 10 or 15 years to? Um, you know, I, I can only hope that the, the efforts of the Americans that fought in Afghanistan in the last 20 years kept America safer. You don't know what thing you can. It's hard to measure things you've made not happen. Right. And I don't know what the Taliban would have done with those 20 years if we weren't there. But I do want to encourage the audience, if they're still listening, to think through the strategic ramifications. That's one of my closing. Here's my two, two closing messages. One, logistics is harder than you think it is. Uh, and there's a lot of good people doing it, and it's tough business. And two, so we need to be thoughtful and creative in our strategies for influencing the rest of the world if we're going to stay externally focused. Now, it's easy to say we're going to retrench and focus on ourselves, but you need to think about, we need to think about, what does it mean when the Taliban control Afghanistan? Where do they go next? Because they will go somewhere next. They need an external enemy. Um, you know, is that is that China? Do they go try to save the Uyghurs and run into the Chinese genocide machine? Do they do they take on the Punjabis and try to get Jammu Kashmir back from the Hindu Kush and, and fight the Indians? Or more likely, do they continue to get in airplanes and go find the great Satan wherever he is and attack the West as it exists as their main enemy? Probably the latter. And you don't get to choose when a war ends unless you win it. Uh, So we got to really think about the sacrifices of guys like First Sergeant Rafferty. What has been done in Afghanistan, take a minute on that, but then really think about what next strategically. Uh, what are the smart next moves other than firing everybody involved? You know, whatever, whatever that's going to accomplish. Uh, what, what are we as a nation? Who do we want to be and what do we do next? I'll, I'll just close with that. Oh, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, I'll let those be the last words because I get them on my mouth plenty of times. So I'm going to just let you uh, put the code on there. All right, let me uh, push this button here. Stand by. <laughs>